All right, good morning. Very good morning to you all. And for those uh, who are following us on the web, uh, I am Mahesh Senegala, Chair of Architecture Department and Co-Chair of uh, the NSF Workshop on Research in Materials and Manufacturing for Extreme Affordability. So welcome. And uh, I would like to get started uh, today by acknowledging and thanking uh, a number of individuals who have made uh, the web streaming and uh, recording uh, of uh, all the plenary sessions possible. And it takes a, a lot of coordination, planning, and hard work, and certainly a lot of resources that I'm very grateful to Ball State University's uh, Teleplex uh, division, which has very kindly and generously provided this so that it benefits all of our students and faculty and staff, as well as countless others, alumni, and uh, people elsewhere uh, who can follow us live and also catch up, because this is going to be recorded and kept online. And so it will be an extraordinary resource uh, that uh, we can all use for uh, archival purposes and also for advocacy, uh, so you can utilize this material uh, in a number of different ways. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Keith Huffman, who has been producing this whole production here. And, uh, and he is in the truck outside. <laughs> so, Keith, thank you. Let's give a hand. And actually, if you could hold the applause till the end, we will give them a grand applause a number of names we will go through. Rob Fultz is, uh, uh, was a producer uh, at uh, the College of Architecture and Planning production. Dottie Cripps and Sarah Cripps are uh, doing the audio. Uh, Sam Clements and Jeff Crone have been uh, working on the cameras. Heather Hunt uh, is working with the tape and she is also in the truck. Uh, Chris Rady has been uh, helping us with graphics. James Whiteman has been helping here with streaming on the web. Uh, Paul Weller, Kayla Eiler, Kirsten Gent have been also helping us with the cameras. Uh, Brandon, uh, and also Brandon Mattingly. Uh, Rick Martin, Eugene Smith are the engineers uh, who are also stationed in the truck. And last but not the least, uh, my debt of gratitude to Bill Bryant, who has been the production manager, uh, who has gotten this whole thing into motion uh, nearly four, four months ago, five months ago when we first met and proposed this. So it, is, it takes a lot of hard work and coordination of all these talented and hardworking uh, uh, crew and staff members. So thank you all very much. Let's give them a round of grand applause. So. Thank you. So now it is my uh, pleasure and privilege and, uh, and I'm truly honored to invite uh, Professor Dave Ferguson who is the Associate Vice Provost for Emerging Media Initiative at uh, Ball State University and uh, he is a Renaissance man with uh, many talents and uh, extraordinary leadership abilities that I admire and we do work uh, closely uh, on the emerging media uh, initiatives and uh, so I have the privilege of uh, uh, being the first emerging media fellow at the university thanks to Dave's um, uh, support and, uh, and it's been a pleasure to work with him and he's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, what this initiative is and uh, in fact this whole operation, the whole workshop has uh, been, in fact, I should say, made possible uh, because of the Emerging Media Initiative. Uh, and we have a number of individuals here uh, who have been helping us with this process. And definitely in spirit, uh, this is uh, very much uh, the initiative of the Emerging Media Initiative. So without uh, much further ado, I would like to invite uh, Dave. Thanks, Mahesh. Uh, so 
Mahesh asked me to say a few words so you understand what we're doing with digital media, what we call emerging media, and, um, and I'll try and talk really quietly so you can continue sleeping until the 2020 presentations. Um, and, and my background, he alluded to, is, is kind of diverse. I actually started, uh, I started as a landscape architect in private practice and uh, then came to Ball State to teach in the College of Architecture and Planning many moons ago. And uh, during that time, I focused on sustainability issues before anybody knew what that word meant. And, uh, and we started some institutes around that topic and got into sustainable community, sustainable city design, and that's still my passion. But 10 years ago, I was asked by the university to start a, our uh, digital media um, kind of front on the, uh, it was really a, a very involved process and we, that led to the Emerging Media Initiative, the Center for Media Design, and several other uh, units. And so I'm this digital guy, but I've got these kind of design and sustainability interests and I've been waiting forever for these worlds to come together and it looks like it's finally starting to happen. And, uh, and I do see some indications in what you're doing today that, uh, and, and yesterday as I sat in, that I, I can start to see how things can impact. And I've got a couple of statistics that I want to throw at you to just provoke that thought. Uh, so what you're doing is very important. I'm a, uh, I'm a big fan and a, and a believer in, in the outcome that, uh, that you're going to drive here and, and what it's going to mean. Uh, so just a couple of things about the university. We, we've made significant investments in digital media in the last 10 years, since 2000, uh, to the tune of $40 million that came to us from the outside and then $20 million that we've reinvested ourselves in that front. And it's not about the technology. It's not about just doing more digital things. Uh, we actually see digital media and the revolution that it represents as a lens, as, as a way of thinking about uh, how processes change, how people change, how society changes. And so that's been our intent. The first five years from, from 2000 to uh, 2005, Uh, we spent uh, a, a lot of effort building what I call capacity. So uh, we, we basically built the infrastructure. We wanted to see, you know, you, you do a lot of things in the digital media world and sometimes you have to throw stuff against the wall to see what sticks. And we, we had to find out who we were. And at the end of that time, we really uh, had a pretty good sense of it. And then so the next five years, 2000, uh, I'm sorry, 2005, that should say, to 2010, we developed a few key areas that I'll mention in a minute. And then since 2010, our, our president of the university has really been uh, kind of quick to, to, to capture the fact that we are uh, engaged at a level where we can actually drive every area across campus into new discovery uh, through the digital media lens. And so uh, every academic college is now engaged in something we call the Emerging Media Initiative. And we also reach out to the world off campus, do a lot of work with businesses, do a lot of work with governments and communities in uh, digital media. Several uh, institutes, one that's particularly relevant to, uh, to your work is uh, our Institute for Digital Fabrication. You heard Kevin Klinger yesterday, uh, he's the head of that institute uh, that was started in 2005 and, and now has literally spun out from my area uh, into the College of Architecture and, and into some other areas on campus. It's become very successful. Uh, the Institute for Digital Intermedia Arts is uh, another institute that was started at the same time. The head of that program is John Philwalk, who's here. And uh, it's, uh, it's too complex to describe what they do. <laughs> but John, if you want to catch John, uh, he can talk to you about any number of channels. But they, they do a lot of work in, in virtual worlds. They do a lot of work in visualization. Uh, and they, they're doing it all over the world. They're, they're, in my opinion, one of the best units for that kind of work in the world. We have an Institute for Digital Entertainment and Education. It's kind of a movie-making arm, or at least how that was envisioned starting out. And uh, now they actually are focused more on uh, educational platforms, looking at multimedia, rich media kinds of platforms, wh what I think will become the next textbook, um, that, that uh, interactive environment that digital natives really want to engage, our students really want to engage. And so we're actually designing, developing, and possibly spinning out a company around the idea of, of what that uh, media environment looks like for, for, for learning. We've got a group called the Digital Core, 
and it's, it's actually structured as kind of a guild, the old-fashioned guild model, where students come in, they're paid, they're working with professional staff, and, and it's a peer-to-peer -peer kind of program where they train other students uh, across the, the campus in software areas, and, uh, and they're also kind of a, a SWAT team that comes in and can solve problems or design things for faculty and courses, and uh, it's been wildly successful. The students really can lead this revolution, and so we give them the tools. They actually get certified nationally in uh, any number of areas of software, and, uh, and they become very good teachers. They become very good collaborators with faculty and, and staff. We also have a research arm. Uh, this may be of interest to some of you. It, it's an applied media research arm, and what these guys do is uh, there, and I believe there's, again, uh, some of the best in the world at it, is understanding what the guy in the street's doing with media at any given time. So we've actually, working with um, mostly media companies out of New York and, and L.A., but, but also other folks across the country and around the world, we uh, go into the field and through a variety of methodologies, some of which we've kind of invented ourselves, we're able to uh, capture what people are doing across all of their lifestyles and all of the media that filter into it about 15 different kinds of media that come through our, our paths. And, uh, and so as a result, we, we actually can get down to a granular level of what, literally in some cases, 10 second increments, what's happening in your day and what, what you're doing with it and what different groups of people do differently with media. And we all know that we've been changed. Everybody has been changed by media in some way worldwide and and so we're just trying to track those changes and anticipate what those mean for the way we all uh, work, move through our days and move through our processes uh, the other another area that they work with is, is eye tracking which is looking at what we're doing when we're staring at a screen and believe it or not that, that that's a very important issue uh, it's, it's one that helps us understand how to design information that flows across those screens to make the most impact so, um, a couple of facts to close with, um, random facts. This revolution continues to astound. Uh, we've, uh, Twitter grew 1,400% last year. Uh, we're now tweeting uh, 60 tweets a second. That's 50 million tweets a day. Uh, the, the fastest growth, far and away, is outside of the U.S. And so we're just starting to understand what, what this kind of communication means. And uh, we're obviously seeing it play a role in um, destabil de destabilizing governments. We're seeing it play a role in crisis management. Uh, there are just an, a lot of applications as people become more and more mobile. Uh, another stat, uh, currently about 2 billion people are wi wired into the net. But in just a few years, that's supposed to go to about 5 billion by some estimates. So five out of seven or five out of eight people are going to have access to the Internet. And the question is, what does that mean? How does that change things? How does that happen when, obviously, we're resource constrained in a lot of places? Well, mobile is exploding. Mo mobile phones are uh, in many people's uh, pockets these days. And uh, it's going to move into the primary Internet access um, uh, mode for people around the world. Uh, this year, 85%, almost all handsets will be web accessible. Uh, we've got near everybody, 77% of the world's population has access to, to some kind of mobile and, and is subscribing. But we're seeing that mobile without access to PCs or other means of Internet uh, access are uh, dominating. So right now, Egypt, uh, and, and you see the number for India there too, have... Uh, a phone, they're getting online, that's the only access that they'll have to internet, and it's enough. And so that starts to, uh, to kind of uh, foster some questions. And this particular site I like to kind of scan, it's, uh, it's, uh, it does a lot of things in the mobile area and, and web-based areas around the world, but uh, this, this has a special interest group for uh, mobile web social development. And some of you may know this, this group and this site. But to me, it's just indicative of where we're about to go and the types of projects that uh, we can see and how just having that access and having that connectivity, uh, having access to the web, being able to connect in all the different ways that, that a mobile phone allows you to connect, a smartphone in particular, uh, it starts to open up uh, collaboration possibilities. These are just a few of the projects. There are many categories of projects. I just grabbed a few from agriculture. 
but you see the nature of, uh, of, of what, these, uh, what these projects uh, are talking about, the, the fact that they're dealing with fisheries management, uh, this is the agricultural uh, um, category, uh, android in the bush, etc., agricultural productivity. Uh, worth looking into, worth, worth understanding how people are just innovating around the idea of uh, the mobile phone, mobile access, uh, and the site is w3.org, but you have to do the slash 2008 to get into these, uh, these types of stories. So that's uh, my world and some of my interest in, in, in a whirlwind tour. Uh, and I, uh, I do think that these worlds are coming together. And what we call merging media, this, this kind of revolution that we're in will not slow down anytime soon. It's going to uh, continue to change the way, and it is changing even when we can't see it. It's changing the way processes happen, the way we design, the way we think, the way we communicate. Uh, even even at, at the level where we're finding new forms of communication possible and becoming second nature, historically we communicated one-to-one -one and one-to-many, and now we can communicate one-to-one, one-to-many, many-to-many, many-to-one, and it's setting up different types of uh, community relationships that, that have more substance than we think sometimes. Sometimes it looks ephemeral, but it really is starting to change the way we, we talk to and think about each other and work with each other. And uh, So to me, it's, it's, it has a, a really strong upside for the work that you're doing. And, uh, and so thanks for your interest, and I'd be happy to talk to you in the, in the corridors about any of this. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dave. That was uh, very informative, and I know that uh, uh, Ball State is a best-kept secret in a number of areas, including this, but I think uh, the secret is hard to keep, uh, thanks to good work of uh, uh, individuals and leaders like Dave. Next, uh, I would like to invite uh, Noha uh, El Gobashi to uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, engineering for change, which I'm pretty sure all of you are getting to know. No. All right, good morning. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, so I was going to start off with thanking a whole bunch of people too, but I think I'll fast forward. You guys know who you are. Um, so really quickly, I wanted to give everyone an overview of what Engineering for Change is. It's an initiative that um, ASME started about two years ago, and since then IEEE and Engineers Without Borders USA have joined as partners. We're really excited about it. We see this as the starting point. Um, but I want to capitalize on sort of the collective wisdom that's in this room to help us define where we're going from here. Um, again, just really quickly, we keep hearing this over and over again, but the traditional frontiers of engineering are broadening. Um, we no longer are working within our own uh, bubble, but we are being asked to interface with a number of different disciplines, especially as it relates to international development. And I see this honeycomb is growing over time until we solidify some of these multidisciplinary approaches. Again, we're not being asked to look at it from the perspective of mechanical, electrical, chemical, civil anymore. It's really around some of the grand challenges that exist today. Uh, water, energy, sanitation, ag, environment, etc. And what's, the, what's forcing us to look at right now is, is how do we leverage um, material resource substitutes, uh, can we revolutionize manufacturing, product design, and infrastructures? And that's ultimately why we're here today, and we think there's tremendous opportunity in these areas um, for us to explore, research, and experiment with. We're also being asked to um, bridge the divide between formally trained engineers and technologists with the local makers and innovators, and I think that's something that's a little uncomfortable for some, some of the engineering community to think about, and it's really pushing the envelope, again, and the boundaries of what we define as engineering, per se. Given that all this is happening, and, and some of this is actually uh, hopefully solidifying, 
in terms of the nexus of all these things coming together, we know that engineers are still being asked to develop cost-effective, appropriate, and accessible solutions, and I ac added actually the word accessible in there, um, to increase access to food, clean water, effective sanitation, energy, housing, and other basic needs. But again, over the past day, we've also heard that there are a wealth of projects out there. We know that there are a number of initiatives already underway. We know there are a lot of organizations, non-governmental, academic, and otherwise, looking at um, developing solutions for underserved communities. But the information is often anecdotal and disparate. Um, we heard Anil Gupta talk about needing networks of knowledge, networks of communities, networks of innovators. Um, we need to raise this innovation quotient so that we don't reinvent the wheel every single time. Um, what's worked, what hasn't worked. And frankly, we need a global platform for collaboration. We keep talking about reaching across the aisle and collaborating with others. Um, that doesn't typically happen within even our own disciplines, but then beyond uh, countries and regions. How do we create that platform of collaboration? So Engineering for Change, um, came in and trying to solve some of these problems. Uh, frankly, we're, we're, not, uh, we're not addressing every single point at this point in time, but our vision is to at some point. Uh, currently, it features an open, innovative, user-friendly online platform that will promote three things. The building of communities. We just talked about the kinds of communities we're looking to build. Content. Um, and by content, that's a very broad term, but it's about building knowledge. Um, again, case studies, what's worked, what hasn't worked. Uh, which solutions have been already developed, implemented, and were appropriate for one part of the world but may not have been appropriate for others. And then, of course, the notion of collaboration. We're really trying to promote virtual collaboration. We're trying to promote on-the-ground collaboration, in-person collaboration, and providing those platforms, whether they be online or uh, events like these. So I'm going to take you very quickly through the site. Um, well, all right, really quickly. Um, so engineeringforchange.org, if you go to the site, which I will do in just a second. I had this all on my laptop, sorry. type very well when people are looking at me. You know what, I'm just going to type it through the end. Yeah, okay. So if you come to the site, it's actually categorized by some of these topical areas that we talked about. And the idea again was to uh, focus on some of the technology solutions, but not necessarily build the site uh, for engineers and technologists alone. So the major topical areas that we talk about are water, energy, health, structures, ag, sanitation, and information systems. And if you click on any one of those links, it gives you a sense of the breadth and depth of content and activity on the site. Um, the more functional parts of the site are the E4C, what we call the E4C resources. It includes a workspace that allows individuals to submit challenges, to submit discussions, uh, to uh, articulate maybe perhaps a challenge that an NGO community is facing that they would like the engineering and technology community to respond to. Currently, currently we have about 83 what we're calling workspaces. And initially when we had developed this, we went along the notion of providing project management tools on the site and we actually moved away from that because we recognized frankly people um, have access to project management tools in various different places. And so what we've developed here is a workspace that allows you to again start a discussion, whiteboard ideas, and pitch solutions. Those are sort of the three major activity types that can take place in the workspace. And the idea again is to promote the notion that you know, you want an ac uh, access to a network of potential experts, whether they be along the technical lines or otherwise. But it's a place for you to collaborate online. It's not meant to replace on-the-ground activity. It's meant to supplement, um, frankly, and advance that area. 
The solutions library is probably one of the most interesting parts of the site, and this is where we've taken a deliberate approach in terms of aggregating what solutions already exist. Uh, we launched with about 60 or so solutions that come from a various number of organizations, including, of course, Engineers Without Borders USA, MIT's D-Lab. We've got some from the Honeybee Network. Um, and the idea is to take a more deliberate approach in terms of aggregating, again, the, the solutions that have been implemented successfully, and to create a constant feedback loop. So if you click on any one of those solutions right now, we've curated the solution so that it's more accessible in terms of a summary. It points back to the original source. Um, there are, if there are related solutions, those will automatically show up. Um, and currently, unfortunately, we don't have the capability to provide the commenting piece, but we're going to start doing that. This is sort of a major effort because what you're talking about is separating this, the components on the site that are user-generated content versus what's actually, again, more deliberately um, curated, whether it be in terms of technology assessment or uh, whether or not these solutions uh, have appropriate documentation that go along with them. So we see this as growing into what we're calling sort of a CNET of appropriate technology solutions, a place where you'd have user reviews, but you'd also have expert reviews of some of these solutions. The new section of the site is where we're, again, making that deliberate effort to write stories about what's working and what's not working. Um, we have hired a reporter to continually help us define what's happening in this space. And so there are different ways that you know, people want to uh, communicate. There are different ways in which people absorb knowledge. And somebody might find value and go into the library, but somebody might just want to read a story. So um, this is, again, a part that we really think has the potential to grow. And, and we're starting to look at multimedia um, avenues of telling stories, not just through written form. So I see a huge opportunity uh, with the Emerging Media Lab here to collaborate. So the Learning Center is a place where we're defining some of the emerging design principles that we're talking about, you know, design for local context, um, create transparent technologies, develop appropriate solutions, not technologies. And while we believe that there are a number of engineers who want to engage in this space, they're well-meaning, but perhaps they don't quite understand the context in which they may be working when we're talking about some of these challenges. And so we, we feel it's our responsibility to educate them. Um, we're also highlighting some of the educational institutions that have programs at the intersection of international development and engineering. Uh, right now it's just frankly a listing, but we're thinking about ways in which we can collaborate more effectively and ensure that there's a uh, sort of a unique and, and um, uh, transitional experience from one site to another in terms of training and in terms of uh, aggregating content. The members page right now is set up so you can see uh, we have about 32, over 3,200 members. You can see them both in list view and if you click on any one member's profile, uh, they can link out to their social media channels. You can also see where they are throughout the world. And the idea, again, is to start enabling some collaborations. Um, currently, we're just mapping members, but we're also uh, looking at mapping projects, and we're looking at mapping organizations and where they may exist. So going back to this, I'm going to skip through all these. Wasn't sure if I was going to have internet access. Um, so what are we doing in terms of getting us from where we are today to where we want to go? Um, there are sort of some key elements that we're talking about here. Infrastructure building. We want to continue to advance the research. We want to open up channels of funding. We want to engage businesses, um, as we've been talking about over and over again, to help create the capacity to allow for, this, for these areas to, uh, to grow. Partnership development. We know for sure, and, and partly why we branded this differently than ASME, IEEE, or EWB USA, is that we want this tool to be seen as a resource to the community at large. Um, our ability to do that uh, is going to be uh, contingent on our uh, reaching out and building partnerships across NGOs, across academic institutions. We want to advance curriculums, projects, and ventures for social impact. We want to broaden our reach, so 
Internet access is great, but it's not ubiquitous as of yet. Um, so we want to look at ways in which we can in integrate mobile apps, text messaging capability, so that you don't necessarily need Internet access to access the network and to access the content on the site. The solutions library, again, we want to build that with cutting edge search capabilities, expert reviews. We want the ability, if you're looking at one solution, to have other related solutions sort of pop up and other content on the site to pop up that's relevant to the solution that you're working on. Or if somebody submits a challenge, we want to be able to push out, have you looked at these solutions that have already been developed? So ways in which we can uh, leverage the content on the site and make the user experience a lot more uh, meaningful. We want to continue to tell the stories of what's working and what's not. And we want to build new E4C programs. We want to build conferences and events like these, continually built on uh, the in-person interaction, not just the virtual interaction. Uh, traveling exhibits of, again, some of these appropriate technologies that have worked. Um, could we potentially start thinking of standards development? So not just look at solutions that have been implemented, but if we have and we saw a number of different bike designs and, and uh, windmill designs. Could we start creating some standards in this space uh, that help uh, sort of manage the health and safety um, and sustainability of some of these solutions? So we have really grand plans. Our organizations are extremely committed to working and helping to advance the good work that all of you are doing. Um, we want to hear your ideas. We want to partner uh, wherever possible. So if, as a result of this discussion or any other discussion throughout the couple of days or after, if you see opportunities for collaboration, um, what's nice about the way we're approaching this is that we already know that what we start with today is going to look entirely different two to three years from now. So we're completely willing to morph into what this community tells us we need. Um, we think we have a re really robust starting point, but uh, we want you to help inform the future. So, thank you. Thank you, Noha. And uh, it takes extraordinary vision, more than anything else, of a leader to uh, make something like engineering for change happen. So. Congratulations to Noha and Shaker and the entire team who worked uh, tirelessly to make engineering for change happen. In fact, a team in one of my courses right now uh, is, uh, has taken up engineering for change as a client and uh, working with them to help and take it to another level. So we are very excited and uh, I'm pretty sure there will be a lot uh, that it will do to uh, mediate work in our own space uh, and, uh, and also forge interdisciplinary connections. So uh, that's great. Thank you again, Noha. And uh, now I'd like to invite um, uh, John Philwalk, uh, director of uh, Ball State's uh, Idea Lab, known as uh, Institute for Digital Intermedia and Arts. Digital Intermedia Arts, okay. So, uh, John, please. And John um, uh, help us with uh, the Twitter cloud uh, that you have all been enjoying uh, in the background, quietly blooming flowers of tweets and, uh, and all that. So, John is going to just show us a little bit of his work. switch into the, the Mac side here for a minute. But uh, thank you for the invitation to address you today. And uh, I'll just kind of briefly take you through a few projects. Um, also to thank uh, Dave Ferguson and uh, Phil Rep and Scott Olson for uh, writing the Lilly Grants, which uh, really made all of this possible and uh, allowed for us and uh, Kevin Klinger and others to really have the opportunity to investigate uh, as, as, we've, as we have done for the last, uh, you know, I guess eight years, I suppose, at this point. So uh, what I'll do is I'll take you through just a few quick projects that I think, you know, perhaps have connection to, you know, some of what this group is looking at. Um, we have our hands in quite a few things. Um, you know, I, I come from art, so our, our focus is, you know, heavy art and design uh, approach. 
Uh, but we're very interested in uh, virtuality really as a platform to connect to other types of experiences, whether they're media, uh, data, information, collaboration. Um, and so we spend a lot of time thinking about those things. And, uh, you know, and also as the Internet, of course, is becoming more and more three-dimensional, um, how, do, how, do, how does virtuality kind of play into that? And uh, so I'll show you a couple quick uh, related projects to that notion. Um, and again, some of these are art-based, but then we always are working with other groups and bringing them really into this space, you know, trying to understand uh, their needs and their uh, desires for technology and how it can actually um, assist them and augment certain experiences. Um, this is actually an, an artwork, uh, but it's, let me show it this way, actually. I've kind of put this together a little uh, informally here, but um, this is actually an artwork that, um, you can say a lot, a lot of this is up on our YouTube channel, um, but it's in virtual space. The interesting thing I think about it is that it shows the potential again for this sort of thinking of uh, virtuality as as a platform, uh, because essentially what it is 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 a sort of a portal experience that bridges. Uh, in this case, we did this in Second Life, um, but what it what it does is it connects to the uh, metaverse of. Uh, uh, photos, let's say, through, through, uh, through Flickr. So you can actually come in here and enter a, a query and it goes out and it pings public folders in, in Flickr and surrounds you with a three-dimensional cloud of tagged images, which then you can do subsequent tags on. This is actually live and you can go to it. It's public. You can, uh, it, it's up and we launched it uh, this week. Um, and there's a mobile interface for it too. So with an Android or uh, iPhone, you can literally, you know, drive this piece, and here's examples of some searches, um, you know, either from within the world or from your mobile device and have a response in virtual uh, environments. So this kind of mashup thinking is something I spend a, a fair amount of time thinking about. Um, the interesting thing about this is all of a sudden, you know, searching, which is, you know, obviously typically done in a two-dimensional kind of independent solitary experience, all of a sudden now is, is 3D and it's, it's shared. So you're in a shared environment and the collaborative aspect of searching is pretty interesting because it's just kind of like the, uh, the breadcrumb trail that you go down uh, with others on subsequent and kind of tangential um, uh, searching kind of paths uh, is, is quite interesting. Uh, we also work, let me see, is this kind of, yeah, it looks a little, let me see if I can do anything about that. Can I? Is Chris here? I don't know. I guess I'm losing a little bit of the image, but I don't know why. Any ideas on that? <laughs> I'd like to get the right side of my screen if I can. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I can, I can live with it. Um, what, uh, so, so we're in a number of different platforms. This happens to be some examples from an environment called Blue Mars. Um, we've done a lot where we've taken um, no longer existing uh, environments, uh, in this case the San Francisco World's Fair of 1915, and we've, uh, you know, which again was kind of a virtual world in and of itself, this idea of a, a white city, a temporary city that the World's Fairs, especially back then, typically were, and we've recreated that. So you can go uh, back into it uh, in, in a, an amazingly uh, uh, high fidelity uh, 3D environment. It uses the Crisis engine, which is, uh, or Crytek engine, which is from the game Crisis. Just an unbelievable uh, environment. Um, so this is, a, we just also launched this this week. It's a new HUD system to navigate. I'm just showing it here as kind of a quick, quick slideshow. Um, but what we've done is we've taken things like, for instance, um, working with museums. Um, we've, we've gone in and we've, um, uh, taken things like sculpture and sculpture that's in a museum, you know, any sculpture that's typically pre-modern was never really meant to be in a museum. It was, it was, it was really intended to be in public uh, space, whether it's architecture or uh, something along that line. And so what we've done is we've scanned, um, laser scanned these objects, we've reconnected them to their virtual, uh, or I'm sorry, their original settings using virtual technology. So you can actually go and visit these spaces and see the objects, uh, how they were intended to be seen. Um, Buddhas and, and whatnot. Um, sometimes we have a little fun with that, but 
Uh, let me see here. We're also, uh, Intel invited me into their new uh, grid, which is called Science Sim. So I'm doing some of the export, uh, exporting of some of our Blue Mars work into Science Sim right now and doing some fun things with that. That environment is pretty interesting. So um, it's actually open Sim based. Um, so we're, we're working with that right now. Uh, some experiments with that. It's a wind, wind visualizer. It actually takes, uh, there's something called virtual wind. Uh, it takes that and actually uh, turns that into a, a 3D kind of immersive experience. A um, little video from one of these environments, just so you can kind of see the, what's possible. The problem right now with, let's say, Blue Mars is that it, because it does use this incredible game engine, it's just it's very difficult to run. I mean, it's, um, you really need a, a heck of a computer to deal with it. But, you know, obviously we'll uh, get there in terms of having it be a little bit more uh, accessible. But, um, but for us, it's a great place to kind of prototype a lot of these ideas. Um, but we also work in more of a lo-fi way, too, which th does have a, a lot more accessibility. But this, this is a d very demanding environment. But it, what's nice about it, too, is all the workflows are completely professional and um, use industry standard um, technologies. So, let's see here. Um, some other projects. Let me stop that for a second. Over here. It's a little ad hoc here. Um, okay, one of the projects we're doing is, uh, for a while I've been interested in the idea of, uh, with, I think we think a lot about 3D structure um, as interface. So um, we're designing right now a, a virtual kind of a campus, but something that could be used by any, uh, any group. And essentially, it's architecture on demand, so that, um, you know, but without the you know, uh, uh, restrictions of physics and materiality and that. So of course, this is in a virtual space. Um, but really, that it's an interface that can be configured you know, based on uh, needs of, of a certain group, small group, medium group, large group. You know, uh, any kind of electronic tools that we use in physical space can also be, of course, replicated here. Um, so this is showing different layers of the, the interface, let's say. But you know, deconstructing the notion of building uh, uh, to a certain extent, but still it, it has its uh, function, of course, for us um, in programming space. Uh, certain aspects of, of this, for instance, like let's say I want a little amphitheater to pop up by going to my interface and click and we're, we're experimenting with this right now is sort of some different methodologies to uh, deploy structure. You know, again, thinking of it as 3D uh, interface uh, to facilitate uh, collaboration, activity, learning. And I don't know if I can get out here. <laughs> let me see, where's, where's, I'm trying to think where that's going. Uh, oh, Hadrian's Villa, okay, let's see. Um, Okay, there. So uh, in February, we submitted a grant to um, IMLS to work with a partner that I'm involved with, uh, Virtual World Heritage Laboratory. Uh, to, we proposed, and we're very hopeful this project comes through, but uh, to, we proposed to uh, simulate using our you know, historical simulation kind of approaches, uh, Hadrian's Villa, uh, with some really kind of interesting angles to it. You know, we want to. Of course, there was an absolute ton of statuary on the site. Uh, but so not only reconstruct the environment, but uh, reconnect uh, uh, items that are scattered across the world, bring them together. Um, and we have uh, actually participation from the Vatican Museum uh, and the British Museum in bringing some of the objects together. Uh, and really kind of the you know, world-class uh, scholars that are surrounding this project. So it's, I'm very excited by it, you know, things like um, restoring the, uh, the uh, polychrome scheme of, for instance, uh, statues, which, we, which our eyes have gotten used to seeing as, as white, which typically were painted, uh, things like that. But be able to go into the environment live and uh, explore that. And I think I've lost my last tab here. I was trying to stay on time, but um, the last project I want to show you, I just have to do it this way, I guess. I can't see my tab, but um, Michael Rush, who's the new director of the upcoming um, Broad Museum of Art, uh, which happens to be pretty close to us. It's up in Michigan. 
uh, Michigan State University, but they commissioned me to do a, to bring them into, uh, to give them a vir virtual presence uh, with their new building, which is a, a Hadid building. And um, so I'm working on that right now. I'll show you kind of a quick, if you haven't seen the building, it's pretty interesting. And um, so my, myself and my, my group are working on uh, t taking this in and, and giving them a full virtual uh, program, um, you know, for the museum, N not just commissioned artworks, but also really kind of extending this into visiting artist programs, artists in residencies, things like that. Being able to take their events that happen there, stream them out live, vice versa. So really kind of a rich um, program. And it's really going to be the first of its kind, so we're pretty excited by it. And obviously with the, this building, it's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, it's for, for designers, <laughs> it's a little hard to compete with, of course, but um, it's such, a, such an amazing space. Um, but in any case, uh, we're very excited by this, and so this is one of our, our latest projects as well. So that's it. Thank you, John. Uh, I think uh, John's work actually raises uh, questions of how to use and engage social media in the work that we do. And I hope that uh, you will be able to take advantage of some of the ideas and uh, perhaps even his unit for that matter to collaborate on any of these. He's been a great collaborator and uh, uh, very, uh, very productive uh, projects that we have uh, uh, been working with him. Thank you. And. Uh, Without uh, much further ado, I'd like to get uh, us started into 2020 number two. <laughs> All right, here we go. And we're going to start today uh, just to give a heads up with uh, Shaima Alarayad. Shaima? Thank you, Mahesh. Good morning, everyone. Um, just keep up. Good morning, everyone. Um, for the past few years, I have been challenged by the uh, problem of finding beautiful solutions for complex problems such as mass housing. This is uh, Davari, um, one of the largest slums in the world located in the area around um, Mumbai. It is estimated that one million people living there will double by 2030. Um, I was also fortunate to um, work and collaborate with Dr. Barrow over the last uh, six years or so. Our work is compiled in this book, which gives a historical overview and analysis of uh, mass housing and how we see uh, the use of technology in providing a solution. Uh, based on that work, this is a proposal for a, a homeless shelter in urban context, which doubles as a uh, urban sculpture. It, using uh, photovoltaics, it uh, converts energy to light at night. We have also worked on, uh, with collaboration with a large team of industrial designers and engineers, we have uh, um, proposed a modular system for prefabricated panels for a housing. This is a cross-section of that uh, proposal, and you will now see how uh, those prefabricated panels could assemble different shapes and sizes uh, according to the context, the site, conditions of uh, the place. We have also tried to utilize recycled components such as uh, shipping containers and we have tried to reduce waste by uh, utilizing the cutouts for doors and windows as partitions within the space. And um, it, you can imagine the uh, proposals that you can get within that. Uh, uh, our work is based on the legacy of modern architects. Um, we understand that our duty now is to pick up where they left off. Uh, the problems that have faced those architects are much more important and provide much more opportunities for us to progress. 
And that is what took me around the world. And I have spent some time in uh, Pakistan, about two weeks in 2007, following the uh, earthquake which took place in 2005. This is an area in the northwest frontier of Pakistan where uh, it's close to where the earthquake took place. And you can notice that most of the housing there are constructed out of masonry and concrete, though it is an earthquake zone. And that raises questions of affordability because that is the affordable form of construction in the area. Within the large scale, we understand that this is a huge problem and the scale is massive and it's mind boggling. And within the current uh, industry norms, this just promises to reinforce a dark scenario where we will see more of these images again and again. This is one of the students I met there uh, showing his proposal to the uh, political leadership there, which this is President Musharraf, and although he has this daunting, military, powerful persona, he seems humbled by the challenge. In the States, it's not much better. These are some of the 145,000 Katrina trailers that were bought because they were affordable. Little did we know that in some years' time, they would cost us even more in terms of health care and in terms of the toxicity that they um, presented. In my own country, and to face the backlog of thousands, tens of thousands of housing units, the housing authority there uh, tried to um, uh, contract with a Chinese manufacturer to build this prefabricated housing units which boasted those characteristics and which promised to bring down the cost 50%. Now, the housing authority um, contracted with a PR agency, a marketing agency, they set up these proposals in an effort to um, touch grounds with the people who are supposed to be living there. Unfortunately, though, it caused a huge uproar. Um, there were lots of uh, negative perception in the papers, and people identified more with the traditional way of building, which is also based on masonry and construction, as you can see here. This uh, reminds me of the work of uh, the Egyptian architect, Hassan Fethi, uh, who is a symbol, at least for us in the Middle East, for architecture for the poor in rural um, conditions, and, and that is where perhaps we diverge here. Uh, his work embraced the thoughts of the residents, and they uh, were involved in the process of building, they built their own houses, their ideas were respected, and they loved the places. And, and, and they are, in many ways, beautiful, though they did not um, utilize technology much, which is how they fell into disrepair. I heard last year that uh, the place, Nugorna, the village, uh, is designated a UNESCO heritage site, and they're repairing the place, but it has, fell, it has lost touch with time and technology. That car seems out of place. It wasn't designed as a carport or a garage. This is in contrast with other architects of the modern era who banked on um, the use of technology at the time and um, perhaps didn't give much thought to what people uh, might have thought. I think a balance between those two extremes is necessary if we are to succeed at solving the solution. Now, the proposal in Bahrain wasn't shelved me merely because of the perceptions of the people, no. The uh, building industry there saw that it is not in its best interest to divert uh, funds and jobs elsewhere to China. So the proposal did not really uh, embed the cultural situation, the uh, political, economical situation of the country. That needs to be designed within the process. In Bahrain, we are back to building the traditional, costly, time-consuming uh, and energy-consuming um, way. I believe that our challenge is not just um, the use of technology or materials. I think that we are challenged at the time being to, to, uh, to find a reliable way of collaboration between the architects, con construction uh, workers, contractors, and suppliers. I believe that we should increase the list of participants in this process if we are to address mass housing as we try to shift that curve to the left. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. And in the spirit of morphing, I threw out all my uh, 2020 slides this morning and put these together. 
uh, as a reaction to yesterday's president. You can see all the pretty pictures in yesterday's 2020. Uh, is a, a Neil here. This is a response to the idea of taking uh, objects in the environment and reusing them. We've done a lot of research uh, on other container kinds of products. I'm going to show you a few of those. But the idea is, as I mentioned yesterday, there's many different products and shapes out there. So the process and analyses, the idea of this is a, a use of a 20-foot uh, container for temporary disaster relief housing. Uh, another thing we've looked at for performative housing for disaster relief uh, re as a reaction to the U.S. product. Uh, this is the idea of taking a 20-foot container and modifying it uh, and having it available for temporary basis for people displaced, let's say on the Gulf Coast or anywhere in the U.S., could be anywhere in the world. But this is an idea of taking a, a, a steel container that has embodied energy in it by the virtue of the material processing and manufacturing and adapting it for a very durable, uh, sustainable, uh, temporary disaster relief housing. It could be used in other parts of the world, and it could be certainly permanent housing in developing countries. Uh, so the point of this is that we're much more interested in processes and uh, methods that are appropriate depending on the situation, which also demands different business models. This is uh, a product we call the Eco Condo. It's uh, two 40-foot containers looking at an open space that's uh, in the, again, probably U.S. market, could be in other places, but uh, this was looking at the idea of transformable space. Everything that we do looks at trying to create a universal space and then having adaptive interior layouts. Nice van der Rohe had these thoughts. Modern architects thought this way. So uh, even you'll see in a moment the eco hut that we propose in Kenya it has taken the same principles. So the book that Shyam and I produced is really a more, more about principles and process, and then that will spend many different products. Uh, these are actually the stack containers that has a custom roof put on top. So most everything we're looking at takes existing uh, products, shapes, adapts them to customize them. Uh, and these are U.S. product lines that we're looking at here. Uh, so the uh, uh, general principles that we're looking at, this is a U.S. market idea in developing countries. Certainly other things economically and culturally are very, very different. And I mentioned that yesterday when I was questioned uh, in the moderation panel about how much impact can your Fab House products have. And I said, well, a little bit, maybe. I said, I think the principles of process are really the art of what we're, where we are right now in terms of integration. And I think that, uh, in terms of impact, is much more uh, uh, important than specific products right now. Um, so everything we're doing is around the principles of modularity, repetition. We publish a lot of papers. We love E.M. Escher's work. There's our artist friends. Uh, nature always repeats. E.M. Escher's work was always about birds until you got it. So uh, we're not going to show all the pretty pictures, but we published uh, the idea of repetition out of nature. We've looked at artists' work philosophically. Repetition is not inherent in the way architects are trained to think. Engineers do it, architects don't. However, the emerging younger architects and the principles to engage in industrial design are absolutely about taking objects, a repetitive kind of forms and objects and creating uh, spaces that are more cost effective. This is for the question that came up yesterday about where do people cook in the little hut that I showed. Uh, this is a kitchen bathroom area, of the upper part, even though currently we're actually considering communal cooking and bathing, but uh, we do have schemes. And this is showing a universal space. The little hut is completely open, and the idea is to have transformable uh, divisional spaces within the hut. Again, universal space using bamboo screens that can be open and closed to create different living and uh, habitat environments. So everything we do is about uh, universal space that can be adapted and transformed uh, based on efficiency and, uh, and uh, other things. I, I showed the slide yesterday, I think, again, about place and space. Uh, you'll see the slide in a moment. I'm, very, I'm absolutely mesmerized by this beautiful earth uh, color and pl plasticity from a material standpoint. You materials engineers in here can analyze all that scientifically. I just feel it uh, in terms of sensitivity. The HUD I showed yesterday, if you will transpose that slide, this is the same material. It's, the same, it's, a, it's an earthen idea for the bottom with a tin roof. Same, same materials that are being used there locally. It's just simply a different shape so that the, uh, structurally it can be stacked. Uh, 
These are some of the earlier schema. We talked about shape yesterday. I want to absolutely reiterate for, for uh, the idea of this. Engineers are wonderful partners, but architects' gift is that they should and understand space and place and human occupation. And so the shapes that we do, and not only in terms of the objects, but the layout is very, very critical. We've said it over and over. We need global R&D. The R&D there, the way I'm showing it, is offshore right now. What we really need is R&D in the middle of the red line. I feel like the R&D should be between, let's say, us here domestically as well as outreach universities, our research partners in the localities where we're doing our work. So yesterday I proposed the idea of a global network of uh, research consortiums among universities uh, that would allow persons who are in the tropics around the world to collaborate in, in colder regions. So I think that's the core thing we keep coming to. Um, I think we have to be politically connected. Uh, I was in Nairobi in October at the ISACARP, and you'll notice the name of the uh, Congress was Sustainable Cities in Developing Worlds. And ISACARP is a great organization that uh, stands for International Society of City and Regional Planners, and they're dealing with what's happening demographically. Uh, so uh, it's all about people. Uh, we're focused on urban issues because I think there's something like 150,000 people a week moving into these cities and developing countries, all out of the villages and rural areas, but because of all the advantages of technology and stuff that we're talking about. So thank you very much. Uh, these are the seven E's which guide the philosophy of the Honeybee Network. Equity, environment, ethics, excellence, empathy, efficiency, and education. Obviously not in all activities are these seven E's combined in the same proportion. The proportions vary. The models of innovation that guide the work uh, may be of interest to all of you. The long tail of innovation describes a phenomena that Honeybee Network characterizes, which means that there are few innovations which diffuse very widely, but there are a large number of innovations which will diffuse very limited, to very limited extent. It's like Amazon.com where you have some books selling very large number of copies, but large number of books sell only few copies. You wouldn't go to Amazon.com if there were only bestsellers there. The ecosystem for innovation is very important. We need not only focus on scale, we must look at innovations which do not scale up as well. The long nose of innovation on the right hand side would implied, of course, the things which are much ahead of their time. And most of these innovations are multifunctional in nature, the grassroots innovations. And multifunctionality has a lot to do with the uh, reduction in the junk of the waste and, of course, generating multiple options at different times. Our lifestyle moves and we generate more choices. And the motivation and triggers for different innovations may have a bearing on the incentives for diffusion. Not everybody is guided by the same concern. And we are also not having the similar motivations. But just as we have different motivations and triggers for taking decisions in our life, so do grassroots innovators. And the, what does it mean? It means that the incentives will have to be designed in a manner that innovations and institutions are matching with the intermediary mechanisms. As I discussed earlier, the transition cost will not reduce if we don't work in all the three areas. Innovations require incentives, institutions, and intermediary mechanisms to match. And the incentives can be of four kinds, material and non-material, individual, and collective. And if there's a need for a portfolio of incentives for these innovations to grow, for the innovation ecosystem to become enriched for affordability. Uh, sometimes non-material individual, which is just recognition. There is no money, there is no material being given to the person, but recognition is very well, important motivator for many people. Collective material, trust funds, common labs, common tool rooms can provide a lot of flexibility and uh, convenience for innovators to fabricate their products. Uh, we must also remember that people can sometimes do right thing for wrong reason. There are many examples that we have. So we must not be uh, disappointed by the rationality that people may articulate. And if it doesn't match with our scientific mind, we must not reject the idea. Uh, there are 
uh, assumptions people make and these are informed by the knowledge that they may have. One of the problems that I want to share with you all is this serious concern that I have that in all the disciplines there is a strong and persistent inertia. For some reason or the other, problems take too long to be resolved. As you can see, on the image on the left shows you a lady carrying water on, the head for head, on her head for miles and miles. What did an innovator do? He designed a contraption which transfers the load from head to the shoulder. Didn't, reduce the, didn't eliminate the problem, reduce the drudgery. Very simple, but took such a long time to happen. See, we must ask ourselves this question, why does it take for so long for problems to be solved? Here is a system of ASU. ASU is winding 18,000 times yarn has to be wound on the left-hand side uh, device manually for two saris, uh, double ikkat sari, pochampali sari. On the right-hand side, it is done in about an hour's time. Obviously, women have more time to do many things. There are innovations of all kinds, including this, this one, which is reflected in what Kanak Gogoi has done in Assam, compressed air car. We have a large number of engines and motors and scooters run by compressed air. Now, they're not optimal. And that's where the ASME, that's where the NSF, that is where the engineers for change have a role to play. Now, there are some features of the formal system that I would like to share with you. One is that future sources of learning, creativity, and innovation would not be restricted to the formal boundaries of organizations. It is recognized world over that large number of ideas are now going to come from outside, from outside the organizations, from the people that we do not even know. And therefore, we need to build networks. The creative networks are the way of life in future. And these networks will not be only of formal people, or not only of professionals, but also the people at the grassroots. And they have to become our colleagues. They have to become our peers. They have to become our uh, frame of reference for, for us to be able to solve these problems. So no one organization will have all these skills that are required to solve problems. And that reinforces the notion of networking, why we should therefore design systems which are collaborative, which are compassionate, which are appreciative of each other's creativity. And that certainly will also mean that we need to build upon informal network the society has. If you look at these three collages, you will realize how we can learn from nature. If you look at fins of all the feathers, fins of all the fishes, feathers of all the birds, branches of all the trees, the range of angle of fin, feather, and branch from the trunk is very narrow. It's about 15 degrees to 90 degrees. The whole diversity of the world is captured in this little range. Conrad Lorenz's work, who, Nobel laureate, who did a wonderful work in ethology, teaches us that nature is very parsimonious. It has few designs and it plays with them all the time. This element that we heard recently, just a little while ago, how nature repeats itself is a very interesting one. But never two trees are alike. Here we show the power of traditional knowledge, how by pooling the traditional knowledge, new products can be developed and licensed to the companies, benefits can go back to the people. We need fractional distillation apparatus for our tribal people in the forests. We need new kinds of equipments. And therefore, let me conclude by saying creativity counts, knowledge matters, innovations transform, and incentives inspire, and not just the material incentive, but also non-material incentive, and not just for individuals, but also for the collective. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, inviting me here to Ball State. This is a short drive, but uh, an exciting visit. So let us get started here. I'm going to be talking about uh, two courses that I've been involved with uh, at Purdue, uh, both for, for a long time, one 15 years, another 20 years. And uh, what I wanted to do was to present that in, in the form that uh, would, would be appreciated in terms of an abstraction of a design thinking process, a framework whereby we can educate a lot of people to build innovative capacity, whether it be low-cost materials or manufacturing or others. The point that uh, we wanted to make in this, in this uh, presentation is essentially captured here, is that uh, early decisions that you make in design embody those values that you want to carry through. The cost is low at that time, but you're committing a lot of materials, manufacturing costs. So there's need for a holistic thinking to approach that. For example, in this project, it's, it's a process uh, and, and it's a project being carried out by a global team at this time. 
for ubiquitous education. And you can see that in this case, you can, uh, for instance, achieve low-cost structures at the same time in increase the value for people that uh, need access to these kinds of structures. Another example, we use case studies, Harvard Business type case studies in the first uh, front end of the class. Chotu Cool was just launched in India, low cost. Okay, it's a cooler, it's not a refrigerator. And if you wanted to design a better refrigerator, you won't get that. Use a thermoelectric cooling, less than $50. Goddard and Boyce brought it out recently in consultation with the company. You can also borrow ideas from, from technologically um, higher, a higher world and, and commoditize it and lower the cost. This is a bicycle that gives us experience of the riding that we had before um, we were sold these bikes with gears and so on, has an embedded uh, computer chip, so computing can become ubiquitous, cost is coming down, and we can use these kinds of ideas to bridge engineering design to design engineering, science and society. And these bridges are to be made, uh, the paths are to be, pa pa to be made, they're not, uh, they're not to be found. And we have a lot of work to do to change the notion of how we think about design uh, and, and bridging the gap from traditional disciplines that we teach in universities. This is a map of, uh, of, uh, of the product and process design course. We focus on the process, a framework, and uh, uh, hundreds of projects have been carried out. At this time, there are 80 students um, around the world, uh, including Africa, and Netherlands, India, as well as Colombia. And we look at a framework for inspiring innovation. And uh, as, as pointed out earlier, if you generate a lot of ideas, you'll find that you, you, got, you get a lot of average opportunities in the middle. At the extremes, you have some very good opportunities and some poor opportunities. So we use a filtration process even to select good opportunities. And the triggers for opportunities come from various sources, like jobs to be done, could be empathy-based design, and so on, and intense collaboration, uh, taking these ideas and using methods such as guerrilla ethnography, uh, videography, cameras are cheap, et cetera. We, we try to promote uh, ways uh, and non-conventional ways that engineers don't know and allow them to learn to see the world in a different way. And thereby, the opportunities emerge into, into useful things, uh, whether it's products or services. An example which uh, we use in another case study is, is the Tata Nano, for instance, in this case. You'll see very parsimonious use of materials, uh, no trunk in the back, just three uh, wing nuts on, 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 the, on the hub, and yet it, uh, it provides uh, accommodation. Another very interesting case study is the Jaipur Foot, again, another one from India, and there's a Harvard Business Review based on that. Uh, cost of this, $50 perhaps free, based on the partnerships they've done, locally sourced materials, locally customized, compared to a $20,000 prosthesis that we get here. And functionally very superior, for instance, suited to the farms. And people have to understand uh, business process innovation also in engineering. And the design strategy can be used to innovate not just in products and processes for low cost materials and so on, but also in their sourcing and how you take it out to the hospital goes to the consumers. And, and this is a process innovation which, uh, which accommodates uh, various things. Also, we mix a framework for, uh, for mixing fun with, uh, with design. This is a, a, a workshop that we co-designed with a collaborator from University of Minnesota. Prior to this was at MIT. And play is essential for us to adapt to the future. And, and so we bring in play into, into uh, and mix it with, with work. And we use various values here. For instance, the values in this case come from, from uh, various dimensions of play. But in general, value for design can come from many things. These could be coming from low-cost toys, for instance, or, or uh, toys for, for, uh, for other kinds of experiences. Uh, but in general, the point, uh, point here is that we want to mix work and play, extend play, to make people think in different ways. Uh, so all the students go through these kinds of immersive experiences, even if they are working in projects which are, which are of, of very different nature. The thinking and the framework that we use to build creativity and, and innovation among uh, everyone is, is, is a common framework. They use storytelling, generate a lot of concepts. At the end of the workshop here we have on the wall um, hundreds of concepts, and out of this came a project called Idea Wall, a wall that shares ideas. And the students are building, for instance, in one of the projects, a way to share ideas across different platforms. Um, also, you'll see here, there's another, another uh, interesting uh, thing we do is very rapid, fast sketching as a part of the course. And, and partly this is to take away the notion that CAD, for instance, fixates people. I have never seen people brainstorming CAD. Uh, CAD objects. Once they are created, people don't want to change it. So we, we teach students ways to create um, sketches and ideations very, very fast. Uh, mixing ideas, for instance, 
uh, in this case, um, an example is, is, a, is a water filtration device which filters water as you transport water in the drum. It's a water drum, for instance. This is a, one of our senior design projects, a low-cost prosthesis, and, and several other kind of ideas that come out of, of our projects. Currently, a project is, uh, is um, uh, ongoing. This is a, a class where we have 32 students um, distributed in, in different countries. Uh, and they are working on computing embedded products and services with a social context in it. And, uh, and there are some very exciting projects that are happening in this, in this uh, course as we, as we speak. And also, we try to embed um, environmental and sustainable thinking by critiquing. We don't have time in the class to push another course. So instead, students design, and we use experts to do the LCA and critique them, and they redesign this. This happens in a week. So in a week, they are sensitized to why they didn't t uh, take into consideration certain key aspects during design. And finally, of course, uh, in terms of innovation, you know, a lot of the examples that, uh, that uh, we see in here are, are uh, solutions which are simple, apparent. This is a good way to start, but eventually we have to move to, um, to uh, technologies which can, which can be made available more widely at lower costs, as well as uh, we have to look at how people want to, want to embody these things. They ultimately, people want to be creative. So thank you very much. Uh, to Noha and Mahesh and Shekhar for uh, having me here. Uh, what I really want to talk about is actually towards the end of my presentation for lessons learned uh, in terms of how to move forward. But before that, uh, I guess I'll want to talk about a little bit about what we actually do. Um, and what we've been working on is to bring complex medical diagnostic methods to uh, anywhere in the world. So, for example, uh, there are tests that you do when you draw your blood. What happens? It goes into a big lab. It takes hours for that lab to actually run the test and uh, days for you to get the results back. You can't really do this in the field when you see people in villages. This is what the test looks like in the, in the lab. Big robots, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And ELISA is one of the most common tests. It's just what it's called in these big labs. We want to take this uh, to any, anywhere in the world. We want to miniaturize it. And I don't have time to go over this, but we really borrowed ideas from other fields in order to re-engineer this type of test, really in the spirit of this meeting, I think, of borrowing ideas from totally different fields. And this last uh, part here I'll show you is the injection molded plastic. And this is a card which we can produce by injection molding. It's a very robust method. You can uh, produce these things very low cost, but it's very hard to etch very small features. And so we can, that's what we've developed. We can etch features as small as the width of your human hair, uh, 30 times less than that, actually. So we developed a lot of these technologies to, uh, to bring this to, uh, to a point of care product. And we really focused this on global health. And so when we first published these studies, they were actually focused on a developing world setting. Uh, I think it's actually one of the first times that's been done in uh, the literature. But we wanted to make this more applied. We started a company. They didn't want to fund this for Africa. There's no, not much money to be made there. So we, uh, we've raised about $12 million of venture capital since 2007. Our first product on prostate cancer monitoring is now approved in Europe. And did that in about three and a half years. This is what it looks like. And uh, there's an instrument. And there's a card like this that goes into the instrument. And you get your test results back in about 15 minutes. And so this is what's done here in the US and Europe in physicians' offices. But uh, we want to have a version that's going to work in Africa. And so I paid an industrial designer with us to, to come to Africa and actually ask people to, in Rwanda, ask people in the field. This is what they've drawn up. So I really do appreciate industrial designers uh, from very early on. And then we worked with some in, uh, industrial design firms um, in New York and actually created this product. Uh, as you can see here, this instrument is a little bit smaller because we want this to be used in the field. It's battery powered. 
This card is similar to what I have here, a little bit of a different version. But the materials uh, for the, this card is really just a few cents. For the instrument, it costs about $100 instead of $100,000. So we've tested this. Really, cheap. we can even give the instrument away, actually. Um, and we've tested this now in Rwanda uh, using just a few different versions of this on hundreds of patients in the field. Sexually transmitted diseases, not prostate cancer. <laughs> so it's uh, infectious diseases are more important in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, our first study is, is going to come out in, in uh, nature medicine in a couple months. And we're excited about that to share those results uh, pretty soon with uh, our research community. We did a cost-effective analysis. Do we really need extreme affordability? What does that mean? Uh, we have this public health analysis showing that to gain a certain disability adjusted life here, to make an impact, our test is actually lower cost than vaccination, which is considered one of the most cost-effective methods there is. And so there's a huge impact, but that doesn't necessarily mean people are funding it, and they're so enamored by that statistic. Gates Foundation is not, uh, they funded that business analysis, but they're not funding it. In, in the US and Europe, usually you have investors to fund the product development. That's missing in global health work because there's no financial return to return or, or, or much smaller. So it's hard to make that argument. But I think one issue I'm really focused on now is also scaling up. I don't think we're short of neat ideas and neat demonstrations. Uh, there's a lot of these ideas around, but there's very few cases where it's been actually scaled up. And so I think that's actually a huge bottleneck, even for a technology like ours, which is quite complicated. Uh, there's good ideas already out there. But that's not a unique issue for this kind of work. It's a unique issue everywhere, and the, and the way that's solved here, I think, uh, is actually by the free market, not by us sitting around and saying, well, what's going to be culturally acceptable and so forth. Um, and so one evolution in the way I've been thinking about how to do this is maybe uh, just to develop the product for the U.S. market. There's a, even the infectious disease product, there's a financial incentive here, and then we let it make it accessible for the developing world. I'm not going to solve the supply chain for them, the issues, the regulatory hurdles, all these issues. And if they want to buy it, then they can buy it. Um, and so maybe that's a way to move forward, because it's otherwise very hard to fund this kind of product development. We've worked with a lot of partners uh, to get this to work. And uh, I'm still sort of trying to figure out uh, how to best move forward uh, with uh, getting this product in the field. But I think we do need some success stories in this field, not just ideas, but real scaled up success stories, because otherwise we're going to have meetings like this 10 years from now. We certainly had meetings like this 10 years ago. So thanks very much, and I hope people in this room can get some of these ideas to actually be implemented at a large scale. Thanks. Inspired by Wes, I wrote a haiku for each slide. So few words, not really me. <laughs> the world at night, showing development, but light bulbs are not really ideas. Brutal war. 20 years in camps, peace breaks out. A chance to go home and start again. A new paradigm is needed to move from dependence to sustainable livelihoods. From MIT to a mango tree, three months to three days. Design, create, build, change your life. Get started, two sheets of paper to support ears of corn. Be creative. 
have fun. A hammer in her hand for the first time. Using tools to make tools. Learning from each other. Towers of shellers. Each one saves 100 hours of hard labor. Made it myself. Sketch, draw, build, learn to design, adapt, evolve, invent. Prototypes aplenty. Tools to take peanuts from the roots. The design process in a nutshell. Returned to smiles, open hands, and open hearts, and pride in accomplishment. Look at what we made. Hoes, machetes, knives, sharpened with a bike, 1,000 shillings, a new business born. A simple cart, eight trips to the well become one, rent it to others, to buy new wheels. Crushing canes, sugar juice has more value. Experiments to choose the best design. Pot in pot, evaporative cooler, from Nigeria to Uganda, great ideas take root. Threshing table, peanuts, sorghum, millet, rice, it does it all, so simple so fast. Rat traps, no wire, old tire. Ingenuity is the most important ingredient. back again. So exciting. They have moved back home. So many more things. So wonderful. Back again. So exciting. They built a home for their ideas. A place to work. Working together, a new roof, women with tools, I fear the hammer no more. They tell me, we don't need things from India and China. We will make them ourselves.
Thank you. Because of the continuing epic struggle between Mac and Windows, I have to switch to my own computer to show you some videos. My name is Amos Winter, and I'm currently a postdoc with the Singapore New University of Technology and Design and MIT International uh, Design Center. And I also run a group at MIT called Mobility Lab. And I'm going to talk to you about opportunities in research, innovation, and education focused on emerging markets. And I'm going to do this much through my own work in wheelchair technology in developing countries. Now, through Mobility Lab, what we do is uh, we have students develop innovat innovative new mobility technology directly with stakeholders uh, located throughout the developing world. And these students learn how to leverage their technical skills in order to make a positive impact on the world. And, and thus far, about 80 students have, have worked on these projects and about 20 have gone abroad to implement them. Our big project in Mobility Lab uh, is the Leverage Freedom Chair, which is a wheelchair designed specifically for use in developing countries, which is fast and efficient off-road, but also small enough to use in your home. And we were fortunate enough to win an R&D 100 award for this product last year. The, mo the motivation behind it is that there's 20 million people who need a wheelchair in the developing world, and 70% of them live in rural areas. And so to get to school or a job, often these people have to travel long distances under their own power. And the issue with uh, existing products, uh, which you're going to see in the next slide, uh, with existing products, if you imagine trying to take a wheelchair for long distances off-road, it's really, really difficult to use uh, push rim propulsion on rough terrain. And then more common products like hand-powered tricycles uh, also have difficulty on steep hills and soft ground and are too big to use within the home. So designing the LFC, what we had to do was both have a product that is very capable on rough ground, is fast and efficient, but when you get within your home, you can take the levers off, stow them within the frame, and you have a, a, a product that's just like a regular wheelchair that's small enough to go through uh, uh, doorways and into bathrooms and can function just like any other regular wheelchair. The key innovation behind the product is the fixed gear ratio variable speed lever drivetrain. So all the user does is grab high on the levers to produce a lot of torque um, and grab low on the levers to increase uh, rotational speed. And because the person's doing all the, the complex mechanical tasks in the system, the drivetrain can be made from a very simple assembly of bike parts. So what this looks like in action is if you want to go fast, you grab low, and as you get to rough terrain, you just slide your hands up the levers, and you can produce more torque at the wheel to basically bench press your way out of trouble in order to travel through mud or sand or up steep hills through rough terrains frequently encountered in developing countries. Um, as far as performance advantages, the LFC is about 35% faster than a wheelchair on a street. And when you're going off-road, it's superior to any other product currently available. And that's because the, the user can produce about 53% higher torque at the wheel than they could by just grabbing a conventional hand rim. Um, when we designed the LFC, we had to make it manufacturable and repairable absolutely anywhere in the developing world with local materials and uh, local production facilities. And a big part of that was using bike parts in every single moving component of the, of the LFC. And that allows us to make the chair for about $100, which is less than uh, or about equal to existing products. A, a very key point in the development process of this was getting stakeholder input. And every single design change in the LFC was motivated by suggestions by stakeholders. And that's what transformed it from kind of a harebrained student idea, blue sky uh, type project, to an actual product that is now on the cusp of uh, global dissemination. And I'm doing that right now in collaboration with Jaipur Foot, IIT Delhi, and Pinnacle Industries, which is a big uh, manufacturer in India. And we're doing a 25 chair trial now throughout the country. And we've got commitment after the trial to scale up to 100, uh, uh, sorry, 1,000 chairs per month produced in India. 
Now, uh, another component of the project is that uh, we got a lot of feedback from wheelchair users in the U.S. saying we would like a product like the LFC. So we're developing a high-end version in collaboration with Continuum, product design firm, and the idea is that we could sell this high-end chair and use profits to support the developing country chairs. So kind of like Tom Shoes, buy one, give one type model. Now, there's three core reasons why I think emerging market research is going to be a huge area of growth in academia. And one, uh, we get to solve problems that affect millions, if not billions, of people on a life or death scale often. It's a, it's a way to engage U.S. industry in a, a vastly uh, or a fast growing market, and we can train our students to be the next generation of global engineers. So I think as scientists, we need to look at these big problems. And, and codify them in scientific terms. So, you know, what's the physics behind water filtration in nature and industry? What's uh, particle ablation mechanics and the fluid flow of, of cook stoves? And use those parametric relationships to deterministically design low-cost solutions. Um, as far as U.S. industry and emerging markets, in our career time, all the big economic changes are going to be in these countries. So you look at Brazil, Russia, India, China alone, they're going to grow from 18 to 41 percent market capital in the next few years, and China and India are, are expected to be the, the uh, first and third largest economies very soon. So the punchline in all of this is there's a, going to be a billion plus new middle class consumers that buy products that we can tap into with U.S. industry, and another billion plus poor consumers, but that can maybe leverage technology to get out of poverty. So as academics, we can be an intermediary, helping interface U.S. industry with emerging markets, and in turn generating funding to support our research on these efforts. And uh, I think we have to expand our idea of affordable technology. It can be low-cost solutions like our wheelchair, but also high-cost solutions that are appropriate for that market. And a great example is GE's ultrasound machine, which had to cost only 15 percent as much as the U.S. version, but could give 50 percent the performance. And so like hotgates in China was a, a great technology. And then the final uh, point is that we need to train our students to be the next generation of global engineers that can go anywhere in the world, immediately innovate with local talent, and understand the cultural nuances and, and the consumer needs specific to those markets. And so what I think we're going to see, as far as the career track of these students, they'll get on the ground, frontline experience through programs like D-Lab at MIT and Engineers Without Borders. And then as they enter graduate school, you can add scientific rigor, engineering rigor to, to deterministically produce technologies. And then as they enter the workforce, they can go to industry, engage them in emerging markets, be like what I'm trying to do, being an emerging market researcher, or go into social entrepreneurship like uh, Paul Pollock's IDE. And I think as researchers, we're going to be at the interface between involving research with industry and these, uh, these organizations. So thank you very much. Okay, great. So, um, I don't know if that's me, but. Uh, so the work that I do is uh, looking at digital technologies, uh, first for many years just in, in uh, our current market, in the United States, and now I'm really starting to look more towards how we can work on this uh, with uh, developing and emerging markets. Um, so what I'm going to show you is uh, a couple of projects towards the end, but I really want to start with explaining that how my grandfather really got me interested in this topic and thinking about how here's a man in the 60s who only had a sixth grade education who could build a, his own finished home. But he started off learning a lot of his techniques from um, uh, techniques he learned from his grandfather uh, who, who used to be a slave. Um, one of the things that was very, uh, that, that is very important is to consider how most products are made. And I think a lot of the times when we think about um, uh, working in developing countries, we're not really considering the precision that goes into making something like a car. So you, a car is made up of thousands of parts, and buildings are kind of the same. So if I was going to make a cabin like this one, uh, which we did at MIT, uh, a cabin like this is made up of very much like that car, where it's a collection of interlocking parts, uh, all created from precision machinery, like a CNC machine, um, uh, hammered together with a uh, rubber mallet. Um, but uh, one of the things that also got me started on this uh, same topic was working with Neil Gershenfeld, uh, the, Fab Labs at MIT, and this is a Fab Lab in South Africa, Sochengovi, and uh, this is a kid that was inspiring for me. He figured out on his own how to download the software, 
create this little car and uh, develop the tabbing system for um, uh, interlocking all of the parts of the car. He figured this out on his own without a high level of education. The most important thing to remember as well is that industrialized housing is not uh, an industrialized, excuse me, is in, housing is not an industrialized product. It, it's uh, made up of a collection of parts that are put together um, by hand. So for example, um, looking at this cartoon, uh, the way that houses are typically made, somebody draws, makes a drawing on a computer, and the person at the end of the chain that's putting things together does not have a relationship with the person that made the uh, design. Um, you have a, a clear disconnect between the two. And pre-manufactured housing is the same. However, the pre-manufactured housing is a very high energy method of delivery. You need a space to make a space. You need a uh, crane to deliver, this, to deliver the product. Uh, you need too many things to make it effective in a developing environment. And for years, uh, architects have been thinking about this, for example, like, uh, the Lustrin House, which was made back in the 50s, which tried to take advantage of manufacturing technology. Uh, it didn't work because it uh, had too many parts and it required too many tools. The same thing with today with Blue Homes, which is a current company. And they, they have many of the same pro delivery problems. They deliver very large objects. So the way that I see the future is taking advantage of computing and fabrication. And, and I want to put in the computing part because that uh, determines um, or gives us the flexibility to make a variety of things. Uh, for example, uh, we can, with computing, we can compute the three main things that I always talk about in making anything, measuring, manufacturing, assembly of parts. Uh, and if you look at this ball, for example, it's very difficult to make uh, if you cut all the parts out by hand and try to assemble them. There are too many angles, uh, too many small ways to assemble parts. You can use glue. Um, that are complicated. But with this, we could turn a lot of those things into variables. This is an example of a chair that a student designed, uh, the student who took my class designed back in 2006. I use it as an example of how to, for students today, so a student in my class has to cut out this chair and put it together with a rubber mallet. No glue, screw, or fasteners are ever used in my lab group. We only assemble things uh, using the force of friction. Uh, for example, uh, here's a, a, the way it would work. Uh, someone would design a, a shape of a building or a car or anything, and uh, we use computing to subdivide that into parts. And then we use that, the subdivision of those parts, we lay the geometry flat, and we use a CNC machine to cut out all of the parts. And then we use just brute force to put all the parts back together because we've been able to measure the uh, assembly calculations or assembly um, tolerances between parts. And the key thing to remember is this last, this little image on the lower right-hand side. That's the, 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 the core value is that data. This is one example of a cabin that we built back in 2005, uh, made out of about 1,000 parts from plywood all assembled together um, by, uh, and held together by friction only. Um, with our, we put it together with a rubber mallet, cut out all of the parts in about four days. Uh, that was followed up by, uh, in 2008, by an installation at the Museum of Modern Art, which was up for about four months. And this, too, was also held together by friction. And the goal of this was to consider, if we were to rebuild in New Orleans, how would we consider manufacturing? And how would we consider variety, uh, and variety in design? So we made a lot of prototypes. And prototyping is, is, is critical, because you don't always know if you jump straight from one scale to another uh, whether all the parts will work. So we did a lot of prototyping of parts to make sure to it that they all snap together correctly. But more importantly, what I would like to do is figure out ways of transferring this type of knowledge to anyone so that they can design, at that time, design in New Orleans, design their own shotgun house, modern house, uh, arts and craft house, but make them as in a collection of parts and a kit of parts. And they could always sell those parts to other potential homeowners. Um, so there were, within the show, there were other uh, buildings. There were um, a few modern buildings, and one made out of aluminum. But the thing that I'm working on now is integration of other systems, water, fluids, electronics, as part of the fabrication process. So for example, the image in the upper right-hand corner is a student who's figured out how to run fluids through a laser-cut wall panel, and they can all snap together. But I want to end with this slide, which uh, talks about um, the idea of making an online fabrication facility. A lot of people say to me that they like the idea of uh, assembly of uh, building kits, 
uh, houses, but they really need a, a fabrication facility. A lot of places don't have the means to, um, to, 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 to um, house the machines in order to build the final component, uh, to build a final uh, design. So um, in, in summary, it's, it's really a, a really great process that has been developed by a number of students at MIT, and I hope that someday I can uh, see this working in a developing environment. Thank you. All right, that uh, concludes our 2020 presentations, and uh, hit a shaker for the next round of Tap Tap. <laughs> Shall we? Well, can I? Whoa. <laughs> That's good and loud. Um, okay, can we hear it? Yes. I can hear you. George, are, are we, is our world undergoing, is, can you hear me? Yeah. Is our world undergoing a transformation as significant of any transformation in the history of mankind right now? Well, I mean, certainly the transformation that, that strikes me that we haven't discussed a lot, although it's inherent in, in the discussion that we have had, um, I think is an environmental crisis. We really haven't integrated that with what you might call the social crisis, talking about mass uh, emigration to cities, that kind of things. There's obviously an environmental uh, component to that too, and the response to that is understandably very different in developing versus developed nations but I think it would be interesting to weave that um, environmental component into the discussion about uh, materials and methods for extreme affordability in developing nations. Well, you know, I think about the Greeks, for instance, who, who thought that they'd un un uncovered the code uh, behind everything using the, the, the golden mean. And, and by studying nature, they were able to decode a proportioning system that they then brought into uh, a physical manifestation in, in, in terms of the, the, the creations that they, that they made in the physical world. And so if everything was in harmony, it was following the golden mean. It was following something that was learned from nature, right? And, and I wonder if, if we're doing the exact same thing only now using uh, algorithms to, to, to map weather, to understand ecosystems, to understand the natural environment, and yet, in, in effect, aren't we still covering the face of the world with our own human understandings of things? And, and very different understandings. I think that's great because, um, you know, we are modeling the world just like um, people in all kinds of different situations around the world model the world, and I think that's one way of turning that pyramid on its head is um, that in many ways um, uh, people who might be at the base of the economic period might also have 
the much more developed model of, of nature and what can we learn from them, um, you know, if a follow up on the environmental aspect, that there's a lot to be learned there. So if, if we look at three distinct uh, ways of, of, of understanding perhaps the problem, we have nature, right? We have our human understanding of things, perhaps the human centric, uh, uh, the human in the middle, uh, and then uh, on the other side we have a technological uh, capacity as well. And the technology is, uh, is not irrelevant. The technology has its own patterns that it wants to manifest. The industrial age uh, has led us to certain kinds of structures per, uh, per chance, right? And I'm curious about this information age. If there isn't something underneath the structure of how uh, things are organized uh, via the networks uh, that, that connect everybody around the world, if there isn't some kind of a bias, I don't want to get very matrix on this, but you know, still, um, I see that there's the human problem. We use technology and we try to understand nature, and somewhere in there is uh, is, is a, uh, a a mix. So I'm I'm thinking that um, we humans tend to view technology as being complex, and if you look at nature its level of complexity is so much deeper than our technology. It's, I think, one of the things we might look for is being able to read the leaves of a tree or something like that as indicative of the state of the world rather than what we see in a microscope. Mm, that's fascinating. I wonder, is nature deeper than we will ever understand? <laughs> Is it sublime? Is there such a thing as the sublime, for instance? Oh, man. If I had known we were going to go there, I'm not sure I would have sat down. <laughs> as in, this is like, is there God? Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Let's get to it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Two or three things I think are kind of universal things that we're getting at uh, that I see is this idea of integration and breakdown of traditional barriers or let's say definitions of things. It's really interesting uh, now the second day of this because I, I see we're talking about two or three really key principles. One is learning from nature, which has always been done in mankind, but particularly now with un even in architecture. Uh, the idea of biomimicry issues, mm -hmm. learning from nature, you're talking about in terms of green sustainable principles, one. So transfer of knowledge into design from nature. Secondly, what's really interesting here um, is the idea of bridging between academia, let's say research and knowledge, design uh, in, a, in a formal sense, and the Anil's position, which I completely agree with, the idea, the fact that persons who work with their hands, who have uh, traditional knowledges are incredibly brilliant people. The idea is how do we marry, merge these knowledge bases as he is doing in some broader scale, scalable technique. And that's the barrier, is how do we do that? Well, I, I think back to the sailors of Micronesia who could go out in their outrigger canoes and cross hundreds of miles of ocean without any navigation system and end up where they wanted to be. And to, to learn that takes years and years of study. And we've replaced that with this academic engine that in some senses we're all, sorry, slaves to. Um, we, we've created this, this other way of knowing and finding some uh, bridge, I right. think, between sort of this intuitive understanding of the world right. and the science-based understanding of the world is, yeah. is a challenging problem. And I think if we could push the academy right. in that direction, we could end up in some very interesting places. So then we'll throw Walter Gropius back into discussion because, you know, he saw the evolution of society and technology and he talked about constantly the art and science and business integration, money. Everybody keeps talking about money. I'm glad you sat down. You talked about money. 
So, so you have this in, intuitive kind of process, this scientific model, as well as business and economics. And I think that's the big gap, is how do you integrate all these big areas. Uh, and I think in terms of even the digital technology, which I'm, of course I'm a huge fan of, I think the state of the art is how do you hyper media, how do you uh, use handcraft and materials as well as prototyped uh, type templates that allow literally the marriage of emerging of handcraft and let's say high technology and also of course the business the business enterprise which is very different you know this whole hyper business model I guess would be a way to call it so yeah I mean I, I'm not necessarily a fan of Gordon Gecko but uh, I, th I think there is some truth uh, to um, the, you know that that profit is not always bad and I think uh, profit is actually going to be the essential ingredient to scale up these technologies. Right. It's really the only way that we know in society to have products distributed very widely across society. So it's, it's something that I think um, it's in conflict with the way some people think about how to, uh, public health projects should go. And microfinancing is taking a big hit, I think, for various reasons. One reason right now is that it's making money. And people think you shouldn't do that. And uh, but if you don't make money, how do you have a sustainable enterprise that actually can scale up? And so I think uh, maybe changing the way people perceive the value of these products is that we're, uh, it's not charity. Is we're uh, we have a customer base, and um, and also the way that we introduce the product to them, it's not from top down. It's not from having this. Uh, white paper of saying this is what you should use or not use. Here's a product, it's available to you, this is the price. If it's such a great idea, you can buy it. Uh, just like cell phones, you know, or uh, it could be any number of these things, sachets of sh shampoo. If you think it's great, then you can buy it. You make the decision on what's culturally acceptable uh, and economically viable for you, but I think it's up to us to try to provide as many possibilities for these markets as possible. But you know, uh, you mentioned about microfinance. Everybody talks about microfinance. Have you ever heard about microventure finance? There's very little discussion on microventure finance. The products for which market does not exist, and what we're discussing here are innovative products for which market is yet to be created. We don't need microfinance, we need microventure finance. Something that the international financial institutions, the big think tanks are not even talking about. So we need to realize that if these innovations have to diffuse, they have to be tried. If they have to be tried, somebody has to take risk. And this risk will have to be absorbed by some mechanism. It could be public-private fund, it could be uh, other mechanisms by which this can happen. And we also need to focus more on horizontal supply chains. The example that we have seen in this conference, many of these are, which do not be manufactured at one place and distributed everywhere as we discussed yesterday and today. They could be sold across neighborhood economies, neighborhood markets. So we need to think differently about the way the profits will be generated in the future. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Maybe I can put in a plug for a project uh, that I've been, I was involved in uh, slightly. This is started by the WHO. It's called the African Network for Drugs and Diagnostics uh -huh. Innovation. And my contribution was to change the, that to also diagnostics. <laughs> and yes, it's called Andy. But what the idea is to go around uh, different countries and, and really encourage the local scientists and the local entrepreneurs to do some of these high-tech ventures. But, you know, and, and I, I think it's a good idea for try to get them to, and try to encourage them to link in with the World Bank and so forth and also just uh, maybe uh, the diaspora uh, to maybe go, go back and invest money. But I guess the issue with venture financing is that it's more money than uh, of the investments. It's, I don't know if it's really microfinance at that stage. Uh, you know, even if you're not talking millions of dollars, you're probably talking about at least tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands, um, which is more than microfinance. So who's going to come up with that money? Uh, you know, that, that, that part is not clear to me yet right now. No, but if you're talking about affordable technologies, we're talking about diagnostic tools which can be afforded by the people, common people. And there's, those tools will obviously have to be designed differently, not by th hundreds of thousands of dollars that will be required for that purpose. Right. Well, we are talking about uh, venture in some sense. I think the key things that uh, matter there are people, 
market, and then technology. Ultimately, it's the people that are empowered to do that. You know, we, we teach students how to design, but in the real world, they have to brokerage. They have to sell their ideas. They have to raise, uh, raise capital for that. I think uh, as, as a part of this, this discussion, one of the things that, uh, that would be interesting to talk about is, is building those skill sets uh, that are needed to do that. And, and if people want to do it, they can, they can uh, make these things happen. Uh, and, and they can raise, raise, uh, raise uh, funds, they can sell their ideas, and we have to impart those skills in education because it's a foundation for all of these, uh, these things. Maybe we should constrain their imagination by putting a small fund at their disposal and asking them to s design a product within that cost, within that uh, limit, so that they can innovate more creatively. Uh, unless we create constraints, unless we make them starve of funds and resources, they would not invent in an extremely affordable way, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, energy, um, all the green uh, issues that are coming up, sustainability cons considerations, cost, the more constraints we have, more innovative we have to be. Um, I was just having a conversation with, with Matthew, and I think we need to rethink when we say profit, there can be huge obnoxious profit and there can be tiny profit, you know, where I'd like to get 10 cents on sharpening my machete, and, and it's actually eight cents for me to kind of break even, but those two cents can make me buy a new bike or put my child to, you know, in school. So I think we need to look at that profit word and, and realize that there's lots of bandwidth on that and uh, understand little bits are probably needed to, to expand on, on developing world projects and, and uh, companies. So. So when you, when you talk about companies, uh, especially for markets to be that are not there, as a lot of these are innovative uh, projects, how, how can we think about uh, these, these new markets and risk reduction becomes a crucial, crucial part of this conversation. So uh, allowing people to think about what the risks are and how to reduce it as they move forward so that it becomes more attractive for, for people to invest or, or for them to take the risk, understand what, what, what it is. Uh, that, that, that part of, of, of uh, uh, thinking, I think, is very, very crucial uh, in, in raising uh, ventures and starting companies as well. I think any time you try something new, there's risk, right? If, if, it's, if it hasn't existed or it's something new, then you're, you're putting yourself into a zone that you're learning and getting people's input and everything. So it's, it's a particular personality to, to try something new and innovative and, and know that failure might, might be one of the options. Uh, I don't know why we can't be bleeding heart capitalists thinking about this in, in tuning the, the products and, and distribution strategies for the market. So I, I totally with, agree with Sam that uh, I, I think these, these, uh, these products have to be economically motivated and there's no reason that you can't make uh, you can't make money off off really low cost products. I think uh, Procter and Gamble and and, and uh, shampoo sachets is a great example of that. They just had to tweak their delivery system and understand what how people wanted to use the product um, in order to make it successful. So uh, people are making a lot of money in these markets. You spend some time in India, in you know Tata is not a small company. Uh, Hero Honda is not making motorcycles there for purely philanthropic reasons. There's money to be made there. And, and so it's not mutually exclusive, uh, both helping people and making a profit in these contexts. I think you're right. I think one of the really key things we have to do is to inspire local uh, entrepreneurs. It, we start them perhaps with a little bit of seed money and then let them move forward with their own. They know the culture. They know the markets. They know what they can do to make money and they want to make money. The world has billions and billions of entrepreneurs. So I think that's extremely important. Let me put in a new point that came out of um, the tweets yesterday, which I saw, that uh, it's a very interesting tweet. Um, the technology problem is a small subset of the education problem. Think about that for a moment. I think that's true. I think education is a key, and a key to raising the quality of life the education so that people can do things better and raise their lives and the lives of people around them. We're both tapped out. Yeah. <laughs>
Well, I, 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 I'm thinking, I don't know how to frame this, but I, I think many of these local entrepreneurs who may not have a classical education are incredibly well educated as being, you know, low, like low, uh, low monetary level entrepreneurs. You know, they, they understand that they need to make money. If they don't have enough, that they're not going to eat, right? So they're, they're very creative. So I, I don't know. What do you mean by education? What, what sort of education do we have I to I think in, in the long run, edu raising the level of education, this is what happened in the United States when the first, the waves of immigrants came in. The parents worked very hard. They worked 18, 20 hour days, surviving uh, to make money, I remember you, <laughs> uh, to make money so that their children would, would get an education and have a chance and they would become the lawyers, doctors, engineers, uh, and so forth. And that was a very important step. We need to inspire that and move that forward so that the same process can happen around the world. Okay, I want to switch a little bit because in listening to this and, and talks we had the other day, the question is where does society value this? You know, you're, there's a lot of talk about helping, but the money isn't following the talk. It isn't allowing people who want to do this as students to go out, graduate students, and then they go get a job. Well, they go and they do all these inspiring things we're saying. Where's the job outside of that? Do they have to go out and become something different in order to make money? So if you want this to go in a direction that makes money, that gets people involved in it, there has to be somewhere for all these people that are training and with the desire to go after that. That means businesses have to get involved and be able to appreciate these people and to give them jobs. Governments, NGOs or something have to recognize the value of it. So somebody has to support this. And so it gets back to, do we really value it? Where is the value in, in doing this? And where is the support going to come from? As you know, that's been one of my concerns, that we train a lot of students in uh, societal work are you turning this off? <laughs> <laughs> to, to do the societal work, and are they going to have jobs? There is some, um, some things which are happening. Companies are realizing that supporting society and doing this kind of work is important because they want it for their image. Um, so I think there's some hope that way. I am, as far as, um, I want to in, in, inspire people. I want to inspire people in, in the countries themselves to, to, to do the work, because I think that's more important. Okay, I'm going to ask you a, a question of would, would IEEE be willing to put its money where its mouth is? Ask its members to donate um, $1,000 a year so that they can support 100 people working in this field, so that that's another way that the dues go out. I would love to, for IEEE to do that. It's one of the things that I, we, I think, are moving towards. My view of what IEEE ought to do is to form its own organization within its structure where people can join, put their money into that organization, just as they now design, uh, 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 join the technical societies. We'd have a society for social in impact. And people would join that, there would be money, and I'd like to get money from the normal stream. But I can't speak for the 30 other, well, I'm not on the board now, for the 31 members of the board. But w uh, I would like to work towards right, something. Like I'd, that. I'd love to ask you to provide opportunities for our graduates who, um, who are, you know, have experience in this field. I think um, Amos showed a, a nice slide that showed sort of, you know, they get the experience in college, they get the passion, they get the inspiration, and then they get the cold shoulder. And so I'd love to see all the professional societies, you know, ASME, IEEE, et cetera. I mean, w we can get the membership to, if they believe yeah. in it, to, you know, put in something yeah. extra and support a significant wave. Yeah, you make a lot more sense than the last woman who was sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, <laughs> Oh, I think I have to give her back the mic. <laughs> I think uh, there are so many things to be done, and the, there's the field and the things, the projects out there for the students who are training these fields to go and practice it. But I do think those pro social projects, as the one I'm leading, must have some incomes so you can keep doing it. If you only expect some people to donate money to, or fundraising like that, 
it is not sustainable th through the time because it has to have something productive to keep going. So what this um, social innovation projects should, should do is like empower people to be entrepreneurs and to this, do these social investments with something that is productive, productive and would make it sustainable through time, not just getting funds and doing things like in a long-term project. I agree. I think one of the more elegant definitions uh, for these types of projects is that entrepreneurs innovate. And that innovation, uh, if you're risk adverse, is very difficult. So we have to figure out how do we create uh, some sort of safety net or at least culturally acceptable uh, standards by which people are able to put themselves out on a limb and know that they can recover if they fail. Yeah. It seems like you either need to create social services that would benefit the people who are risking things or you need to figure out a way for the uh, industries to support the innovations. I think you must find like, the networking between industries that support these innovations but also you have to give knowledge to the people, to local people who has the needs, give them knowledge, give them technology, like give them the, the resources so they can do the innovations for, by themselves, or at least apply what, what the research field is doing in the local field, in their daily life needs. So what I, what I want to say is like, this should lead to empower people to do things by themselves, not just do, I know the profit is important, but not for the, for the educated people who can do profit for other markets, but to empower the, the base of the pyramid people to do profit for themselves. Mm -hmm. I don't, I no, don't know I, if I did say it like. I think you said something well. <laughs> 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 Thanks. Thank. Thank. I, I want to thank all of you for participating because it was not part of your agenda. It's something that impromptu. We just thought of something to do something. I truly appreciate. You heard a lot of diverse, diverse viewpoints in terms of business models, in terms of profits, in terms of, and that was really the intention was to kind of generate some dialogue. Uh, we don't want to get tapped out here because you still have a discussion session that's going to be a really focused one. We're going to drill down on it, build on what we did yesterday. We have a few set of deliverables. There are some expectations today as well. So I think it's a good time to take a few minutes break, and then we'll head to the other side to do a discussion. And again, thank you so much for participating in this again.